Africa, feed Africa, integrate Africa, industrialize Africa. Greetings and welcome to this special coverage of the World Economic Forum taking place right here in Kigali, Rwanda. We have been covering this event for you and speaking to delegates and kind of getting the views on what's really transpiring in those conference centers. At this moment, we are speaking to none other than Dr. Mokisa Kitui, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations Trade Development Agency. Thank you for speaking with us, Dr. Terry. You have been quoted enough times looking at, of course, um, talk 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 without action do you think that WEF is also much of talk without action, action well action. thank you very much for having me first of all uh, th th this forum has been very interesting because uh, I've been attending a number of sessions with heads of government and one of the things we agreed on the prompting of uh, Sir Ramaphosa was instead of doing what in French they call yaka yaka meaning, uh, yes, we can do this, we can do this. We're saying, what are we going to do? And it's very practical to have specific suggestions. And we had a number of very interesting specific suggestions about responsibilities of government leaders, responsibilities of the private sector, responsibilities of academia in creating the dynamism of Africa again to realizing the agenda that was set aside over the past few years. And we we're, were making some very useful and interesting uh, progress. I was particularly impressed, you know, by leaders of government delegations who are saying, I wish more of the policy makers in my country were here to listen to just what's going on here and, and get a bit bigger than the pettiness that has been informing our policy narrative at home. And I think you could say that for Kenya as well in many, many ways. Rwanda, President mentioned, is really more on that right now it's not really a time for, you know, getting what foreign direct investment, but also looking at also how Africa can come to a level playing field sort of with international investors. If you take the year 2014, Global foreign direct investment into Africa totaled 52 billion US dollars. In the same year, investment related tax evasion, tax avoidance, and illicit transfers out of Africa, of the developing world, equaled 100 billion dollars. So that means if we level the investment field, the playing ground, we reorganize to sustainable levels the investment agreements we have with others we can slow down the loss of money, which is much more than what we're getting compensated by new investments in Africa. So uh, leveling the investment field is important. International cooperation on avoidance of illicit transfers out of Africa is critically important. International governance on tax evasion and smoking out the corrupt thieves who have stored our money abroad in tax havens is critically important. And these are issues that come to the fore at a time when Foreign aid is not going to be sufficient for the ambitions we have on infrastructure investment. And our taxes are eroded when illicit transfers continue while we're talking about FDI flow. Isn't this an issue of social fabric? The African social fabric issues are, are challenging but of a different nature. First of all, in some countries, the cultural to uh, tolerance to corruption inhibits the war against the crime of corruption. In some societies, you are comfortable with a person who is generous with money without caring where he gets the money. That is contrary to the culture of fighting corruption. In countries who have developed the notion that everybody must get rich quickly, and you start telling young people that the main thing they should ask is where are the low-hanging fruits for us? The society which drives the desire for low-hanging fruits for young persons is a society which is mainstreaming the culture of easy-gotten wealth. It's a first step towards corruption. Due process is a structure of predictable society where sound investment, thrift, hard work is rewarded. But shortcuts are punished severely. And that culture is what you say is embedded in some societies, but it's not everywhere. It's certainly not operating explicitly in a country like Rwanda today. Let's look at the return on investment. We have thousands of delegates who are attending these functions over here and deliberations ongoing. How do you assess the level of impact that WEF will have to Africa in general? I mean, if you look at coming to a conference, first of all, for the private sector players, some of them already make contacts that will yield investment outturns that are much, much larger than the, the, the amount of money they've spent on coming here. And even harvesting ideas of what are the frontier issues of uh, new venture funding, what are the possibilities of impact investment. These are ideas that are invaluable and you cannot assess them, reduce their value to the cost of the ticket and accommodation in Kigali. Number three, persons who don't see other people's thinking and other best practices 
are complacent about what is possible. You say, oh, now we didn't have enough motorbikes in my village, now we have motorbikes who are a developed community and we are growing. But if you start to see that it could have been better than that, that there are potentials of building a momentum towards more than that, you challenge yourself to a higher level. And that's one of the main values of this kind of meetings, that you look, you lift your horizon, the ceiling becomes higher for yourself, and your aspirations become larger than the very provincial ones that have been informing you in the past. And that's what I see from here. Still staying with WEF, um, there has been talk on the ground that perhaps this is a program that really suits the foreign investors because you know the program is all laid out and really Africans do not have kind of an equal participatory level with the foreign investors. Do you agree with these sentiments? There are two sides. First of all, Africa must talk with itself but also talk with the rest of the world. We relate with the rest of the world. We talk about what can be done in policy terms but we also talk to say how can we encourage greater investment from around the world. Having said that, it is true that Africa has surrendered space to the World Economic Forum, which is a Geneva-based NGO. But we have failed to create a forum where African academia, civil society, government and private enterprises talk together about what are our challenges. How can we raise the ceiling? How can we find synergies in our policy coherence between the governments? That discourse is possible without having to go through a Geneva-based NGO, but we have not developed it. So WEF, as it were, has moved into a space that Africa has not created for itself. Still looking at events, let's talk about Ancted 14, which will be held in Nairobi uh, later on in July. I know you're chairing um, the organization committee that's looking into this. Can you give us a snippet on what to expect? Okay. All right, uh, I can confirm that uh, so far, the list of, uh, we, we selectively invited presidents and heads of government from around the world representing different regions and so far I have uh, most of the invitees have confirmed um, of the confirmed participation of uh, the president of Ireland of the confirmed participation of the president of Colombia uh, the president of Mongolia um, today I got a president confirmation of president Kagame I have a written confirmation of President Museveni. I have uh, almost assured the presence of the President, President Bachelet of uh, Chile. Uh, I'm looking, I still have a pending uh, invitation to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada. At the pre presidential high level segment, I'm already satisfied that we have uh, reached our, our targets. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon confirmed his participation, have confirmation from at least six fellow under secretary general of the united nations so the un agencies level is sufficiently covered as a vet of wto arancha gonzalez of international trade center have confirmed their participation so those segments are confirmed the world investment forum which for the private sector in kenya is the most exciting component because it's a, it has a trading floor as it were we have a match making tent where entrepreneurs can come and meet uh, impact investors, uh, meet uh, fund managers, mad entrepreneurs, meet uh, innovators who are looking for partnerships to go into business in Africa. We have progressed very well in preparations for this. I have uh, set up the machinery for the Global Commodities Forum. The Commodities Forum in Nairobi is very important because the last time a commodity forum made rules that have been binding and important in how to strengthen the negotiating power of commodity dependent countries was anchored for in Nairobi in 1976. We are expecting the next most important on commodities to be anchored 14 in Nairobi 2016. Mm -hmm. and so the preparatory work is going very well. The youth forum has excited a lot of youth around the world. We originally wanted to have 250 youth, we have more than 3,000 international applications. Uh, last week, uh, students at uh, Strathmore University expressed their desire that all of them wanted to be at the youth forum, uh, and so on. So the momentum is very good, and I'm just looking forward to one of the most successful international conferences. I, I like the diversity. You know, you're looking at private sector, government, you have the youth. Civil society. Where are the women? Women are not a stand-alone group okay. in our work. However, we have a day dedicated to strengthening women enterprise. Mm -hmm. I run an organization which has one of our branches. It's called Empretech. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship Training and Empowering Program for Women. And during the conference in Nairobi on July the 21st of July, uh, of, 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 uh, 21st Thursday, we are going to have a gala night awarding the most successful innovative women entrepreneurs who have benefited from UNCTAD support on empowering women traders. 
And similarly, we are having a Kenyan cultural phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, a Kenyan culture, uh, fashion show, mm -hmm. uh, which is being run with the uh, leading women uh, fashion artists and uh, creative industry players as part of the women agenda. Wow, that's something uh, really to look forward to. Um, uh, before I let you go, uh, earlier on we were speaking uh, to a few delegates and we're just kind of looking at an analysis of uh, the Africa in general. And here we're looking at West Africa, East Africa and South Africa. If you could kindly give us an analysis on uh, these three regions and the economic potential. Southern Africa has been hit more than any other region of Africa apart from Nigeria from the, the bust of the commodity super cycle. Uh, South Africa last year realized a 74% decline on foreign direct investment compared with 2014. West Africa has a mix of beneficiaries from countries that were not energy dependent and those like Nigeria which are very substantially dependent. The post-Arab Spring countries of Northern Africa are still grappling with the challenges of uh, uh, terrorists and uh, threats, the existential threats to the national state and the recovery from the collapse of politics of countries like Libya. Eastern Africa has realized the most stable increase in FDI in spite of uh, the crisis and slowdown globally. But most importantly, Eastern Africa as a net importer of oil has been a beneficiary in the collapse of oil prices. Relationship between countries, there's something very telling. You know that in the past week, Volkswagen has decided to close down its manufacturing plant in South Africa and open it in Kenya. Uh, Volvo Trucks is in the pipeline for a similar project. It's very telling that if the conditions are improved in Eastern Africa, the possibility of becoming a major driver for new in manufacturing related investments exists in a scale that has not been there before. But there has to be a coherence between the spoken and the, uh, the, the implemented word. There's been a coherence between private sector needs and public sector engagements. There has to be a lowering of the political tensions and the insult exchanges and generally reducing the cost of the political campaign for the next one year, a critical year to ride out the momentum that had started building. I think these are some of the things that you have seen in the play. West Africa? Eastern Africa, for example, mm -hmm. has had a much more structured and more extended development in terms of regional integration and liberalizing the movements of factors of production than West Africa. My organization is helping the governments of Nigeria, Mali, and Benin as part of the first platform to upgrade the level of services and trade negotiations for regional integration so that they are in sync with the level that has been reached in Eastern and Southern Africa as a way of interlocking the blocks for a continent of free trade area. Yeah, but Western Africa is substantially behind, way behind Eastern Africa in terms of regional integration on this moment. I think you really support the East African more. <laughs> I can't pick any. <laughs> I pick all regions. Uh -huh. But well, that means I have more work to do in West Africa than in East Africa. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe just looking at uh, the East African community and of course, um, kind of the progress that they have made uh, so far. Um, what is your assessment on the same? Well, they've come very far. They were slowed down by the reluctance of Tanzania to work in lockstep, uh, lockstep with the others in the initial phase. Uh, I don't think that that has totally gone away yet, uh, particularly on questions of uh, reversing community policies on, 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 on maize trade. Um, unfortunately for Tanzania, it bans maize export whenever it has a surplus, which means it artificially suppresses domestic prices for the producer. And similarly, uh, Kenya cannot continue hiding inefficient sugar industry behind policies of high tariffs and protectionism. It has to address competitiveness because in the long run, Kenya cannot forever bar Uganda from exporting sugar to Kenya. Uganda is too important for Kenya to continue that as a policy. Uganda has to find a more straightforward policy about why it is so uh, sensitive to Kenyan dairy and beef products. So the, the, apart from these uh, nuances and apart from insufficient attention to the felt needs of the border communities, uh, Eastern Africa is moving pretty well. Uh, there are little gains and uh, losses uh, in uh, contracts on pipelines and railways and so on. But this is not the real big, bigger picture. The real bigger picture is consolidate the gains of East African integration, start building regional tr value chains in production and marketing, build on that to go further on a field in, East, in Africa but forever keep building a competitiveness and a higher quality of a product with value addition in East Africa. That's the only way of getting to the future. 
lastly, Dr. Terry, um, listening to you, we are a rich continent and we have a lot lined up for us. Um, but from where you sit, what is holding Africa back? A combination of things. You settle for very low ceilings. You set yourselves very low targets. You are not ambitious enough. Secondly, you let petty things like petty corruption among individuals distort your priorities and sap your energies. And third, you do not find synergies between the different groups. You find more competition than synergy when you are able to grow together. And the sum total of your efforts is larger than your numbers, but you don't realize this, both politically and economically. Call to government, call to private sector on that, those issues? It is too late in the day to play petty. We should start seeing the major players in the private sector qualifying qualitatively new and more sophisticated products. We need to see research institutions and government education institutions having a convergence in the development of human skill and connection to the demands of the labor market. Just a continued mass expansion of general degrees from university not related to the market needs does not drive us up. It just drives up the number of unemployed and often unemployable graduates. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukisa Kitui, for speaking with us on NTV. Well, that has been Dr. Mukisa Kitui, the Secretary General of the United Nations Trade Development Agency, UNCTAD, giving us an analysis of what has been taking place right here at the World Economic Forum in Kigali, Rwanda, with him also giving a call to government and a call to private sector being the two key drivers of the African continent at large. My name is Laban Clifford We've been covering this event for you um, right here in Kigali. Rwanda and stay tuned to NTV where we'll give you more analysis and more series of dialogues that we've covered for you during these WEF meetings here in Rwanda. For now, I bid you goodbye and enjoy the rest of the viewing. Africa, feed Africa, integrate Africa, industrialize Africa.